Sy is genoem gesels ek verochend met professor Adrian Tode van hy is by die fakulteit veeartsenijkende by die Universiteit van Pretoria. Professor Baar, welkom. Welkom to Groot Plaas. Thank you very much. It, this is such a, a, an awesome theme to talk about. Um, just tell me a little bit about this, this, you know, leopards going or cheetahs going to a new home. Yeah, we, we want to know right where it started. Yes, okay, please. So the, the cheetah, um, Asiatic cheetah, which is a subspecies of cheetah, and they're all the same species, mm. but this is a subspecies that occurred in India, uh, went extinct in 1952. Um, it had occurred over most of the areas of India except the sort of forested areas. Yes. And um, in, very interestingly, they were used uh, during the medieval times in India uh, for hunting of Indian black blackbuck. It's what we call coursing. Really? It's, you know, so it's, it's part of a kind of hunting sport. Mm. And um, the problem was that these animals didn't breed so well in captivity, so mm. they had to actually capture these animals from the wild. And the nobility of, of India at the time then used them for the sport. Mm. Um, there were p people that were specifically trained to try and train them to, to hunt these black buck. Mm. But of course, removing so many from the, the wild for this kind of sport activity mm. definitely had an impact on the numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's thought that that certainly had a, an issue, uh, created an issue with, with regards to the total numbers in India. And then when the British colonized India, they also didn't really have much uh, value for the, for the cheetah and mm. often hunted them and paid sums of money for them to be hunted. Oh my um, until the last ones we've probably shot around, I mean, 1947 on record, there were a few uh, appearances of um, cheetahs in the 1970s, but after that really we, we don't have any records of, of them uh, remaining in the continent. So since then, mm. India has definitely tried to uh, reintroduce the cheetah. It's the only large mammal uh, or, or carnivore, sorry, that has mm. gone extinct in India in modern times. Really? And so it's, it's been quite a high priority for them. But uh, they initially wanted to get some cheetah from Iran. Uh, but because of the political situation mm. there um, and the small numbers, there are only about 12 Asiatic che cheetahs left in the wild in Iran. Um, so that's not a, a good source population. Mm. Um, and then since 2009, they've been doing some planning. Um, the, uh, this has gone through the Indian high courts. And basically in 2019, the decision was made uh, or permission was given mm. by the Indian High Court to allow the introduction of cheetahs back into India on an experimental mm. basis. And um, the, we had some good ties with some Indian veterinarians, mm. wildlife veterinarians, and they contacted us and asked if we could assist. And we said we'd love to be part of the project. Mm. And basically since then, we've really been planning uh, the project. So... We in South Africa, we have got enough cheetahs now, really, to, to be able to supply them uh, with the you know, wild cheetahs mm. in Africa. So. And you mentioned the term, the reintroduction of cheetahs in India. Yeah. So what is that? I mean, what's the goal? What, what, mm. what would we, we like to see out of, this, out of this exchange almost? Yeah, so there are two main goals with the project. Uh, firstly, the reintroduction of a key carnivore species that plays a very important role in the ecosystem. Now, it might seem a little bit strange because you've got tigers, you've got leopards, you've got other big uh, cats in mm. India. But the cheetah, um, you know, has a, a different role. It, it hunts mainly during the day. It goes for a different kind of prey to the leopard and to the tiger. Mm. Um, and those have Im impacts directly on the behavior of those animals, mm. which then indirectly has an uh, impact on the, on the vegetation. That's, yes. So, um, and then the whole ecosystem changes. And we, one of the most... Classic examples of this is when they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone National Park. And this top-down effect was quite dramatic. In the end, we really? even saw changes in the water courses in the park. Really? Just from introducing, uh, you know, the wolves into the park. So that's the, that's the first sort of objective, is, mm. to, is to reintroduce an animal so that it can perform a pro proper ecological mm. function. Mm. Uh, the second main reason is because the cheetah is such a charismatic uh, species mm. and uh, it's not particularly dangerous, it's the perfect species for ecotourism. It's, you know, it, they attract a lot of uh, photographic interest yeah. and so on. So uh, people just love to watch them. Mm. And um, they create a whole um, impetus for further uh, conservation mm. um, projects. So, for example, if you want to have cheetahs in, in any particular park, you need to have prey species for them to feed on. Those prey species need to have something to eat. So there's yes. got to be a, a proper, you know, landscape with vegetation for them to eat. Um, and so when you have this real focused uh, conservation of the cheetah itself, 
then everything down kind of benefits in terms of conservation as well. Yeah. And there are certain areas in India, you know, with the grasslands, savanna grasslands and uh, open woodlands that have suffered a little bit because of uh, neglect and, mm. and uh, there's, there hasn't been a, a key driver for conservation in those areas. So things like the Indian bustard, which is a, a, a ground-dwelling bird, um, is now also quite, uh, you know, endangered at the mm. moment. But nobody really cares. You know, the people don't care. But you now give, give them a cheetah and mm. uh, suddenly they care. The politicians care. Yeah, care. You know, they're going to put some money behind this. Um, and that then has this kind of filtered down conservation effect mm. to other animals. We're going to continue our chat just now. We're going to continue our chat just now. We're going to continue our chat just now. Ek gesel steeds met professor Adrian Tode van die fakulteit Veerts en Eikende by die Universiteit van Pretoria. Prof, I, I think when it comes to a memorandum of understanding between two countries, uh, let's say like in this case, what does that entail? I mean, obviously we won't just send animals anywhere. There must be, what is this memorandum of understanding? What does it entail? Yeah, so uh, mm. <laughs> I think there's a bit of confusion that a lot of people think, oh, well, we're going to start exchanging animals. You know, That's get, not what's get happening. Some, <laughs> get some extra tigers, you yeah. know, as if we need those. No, yeah. no there's, there's no animals that, other than perhaps cheetahs in the future, coming back from India to South Africa as part of, we're going to, we see them as part of what we call a meta population. Um, so I think in, in all of our minds, we have this idea that we're going to have these pristine wildernesses when, where everybody can leave nature to carry on on its own. Uh, that's ideal, and, mm. and we all want that. Yeah, best but that's case scenario. Yeah. not the reality that we live with today. Mm. And we're finding really that management of a species is becoming more and more important. Mm. And intensive management of that has certainly benefited the cheetah in South Africa. In the small reserves, fenced reserves, moving animals around, we've, we've created a lot of benefit. In India, they operate a very different system. They've got open systems, no fences. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of interaction between things like elephants, tigers, mm. leopards and yeah. humans all the time. But the government in, you know, really creates incentives uh, for people to protect the wildlife. They've also got a very different culture with regards to mm. animals. Mm. So that creates, an, it might not work so well in South Africa. But there, I think there are lots of lessons. Uh, we, we sit on these kind of Absolutely. opposite extremes in the yes. way that we work with wildlife. But I think there's a lot to learn. Mm. Um, and in certain areas, they might adopt some of our uh, conservation mm. strategies. And uh, we may do the same, uh, you know, on mm. the side. So the main part of the memorandum is, OK, yes, to supply them with the cheetahs. Mm. But then there's also uh, a lot of um, cross-pollination in terms of and learning and understanding. Uh, we were very likely to send mm. um, people over to India to kind of learn how they do things. Mm. Um, also at the Wildlife Institute of India, which we're partnering with. Um, they've got training courses in, in conservation. And so lots of skills transfer that, that I think can take place. India mm. has been very successful in their large carnivore uh, conservation. They've doubled their tiger population in the last 10 years. Mm. Um, and they deal with this human-wildlife conflict very, very well, which we really have no experience in. Yeah. We, on the other hand, have one of the best um, veterinary wildlife uh, you know, uh, groups in the, in, in the world. We are uh, well known for our wildlife uh, work in the veterinary uh, sphere. Yeah. And um, I think there are a lot of skills that we can transfer over to them. So it's mainly I skills transfer. Mm. And um, yeah, there's some, and, and partnering with them. Mm. You know, so. What are some of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to cheetahs? I mean, you've, yeah. you, I think you know much more than I mm. would ever know. What, have come, what has come across your table that's just made you pff, laugh almost? <laughs> I think the, one of the big, <laughs> yeah. I think one of the biggest misconceptions we have is that cheetahs are really adapted to this kind of open grassland type environment where they can run at high speeds and you know catch these mm. small antelope. Mm. Um, in my view, and what we've seen certainly experience in South Africa um, and Southern Africa is that cheetahs actually really do well um, in very dense in, environment, mm. uh, thickets and, and mm. Mm. dense vegetation environments where they don't have to chase animals, where they ambush the animals very much more like uh, a leopard would do. Mm. Um, and we would actually consider uh, the only reason why that is so popular is because, you know, National Geographic and everybody yes. else can the film. Yes, running, yeah. yes, obviously. Yeah. And I mean, how many kills are you going to see in that open plain you know, because it's visible. Mm. And then, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, many, many researchers, that was the, the, the place that they did their PhD research on cheetahs. Mm. 
And so that was then accepted as this is the ideal environment for a cheetah. And, and in our view, I mean, cheetahs only occupy about 9% of their his historic range. Um, so that's tiny compared to the... Sure. They occurred over pretty much most of the savannah across uh, Africa and all the way into Asia. Mm. And um, in those environments, it was desert environments, it was quite dense uh, woodland that they also would have occupied. Mm. When you bring cattle in and farming in, the farmers are going to take the ideal spots first, you know. So what we were really, really left with in Botswana, Namibia and East Africa, mm. the Serengeti, Maasai, Mara, those are the kind of areas that are kind of left over. And that's mm. where cheetahs are, are still survive today. Yeah. But it's not their ideal environment. So um, I think that, that misconception... So when we, if, when we talk about India and we, and we show them pictures of India and, and it's, you know, quite thick... Um, Savannah, uh, there's grassland there mm. as well. But I mean, I, I think sometimes if you were to take somebody whilst they're sleeping, take them across to India and wake them up on the other side, they wouldn't know that they're, they not, wouldn't know, yeah. they, they're not in Africa. Mm. You know, so, but it is certainly, it would look like um, the bushveld, for example. That's and um, the cheetahs, we expect them to do well there. Mm. Lastly, we've got about two and a half minutes left. If we look at this process of getting the cheetahs to mm. India, um, it's 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 is it is it quite an easy easy process? I mean, are, are they calm? Are they sedate? How yeah. does that work? If you asked me that question sort of five years ago, <laughs> I would have I, I mean I would have been a flat panic because yeah, yeah. we we have lost cheetahs during transit. Its uh, mm. mortality rate is pretty high or was pretty high. Yeah, yeah. So we've been developing some um, sedation strategies. Um, uh, and focused on, on treating them, um, keeping them as calm as possible. Yes. And then we've got certain drugs that we now give them during the translocation that have proved to be very, very effective. Very so these are actually very old drugs that have been yeah. around for ages. But anyway, we use those and um, the, the animals sleep most of the time during mm. the translocation. But it is about a 36-hour journey from it's when we load long. them into the yes. crates uh, all the way. They have to they fly to India, from India they get transferred from the aeroplane to military helicopters, then they get flown from there to Kuna National Park uh, where they get dropped mm. off and then driven by truck to the actual mm. uh, final destination. So it's a lot of handling, a lot of noise. Yes. We try and minimise that as much as possible, but it's a major undertaking. And I presume they are welcomed like celebrities when they get Absolutely. there, Absolutely. Right? I mean, I already asked this morning, what are their names? And we oh, said, well, shame. we don't have names oh, for them. Oh, they're going to name them. <laughs> they will do. Well, yeah. that's, that's really yeah. wonderful. And um, I, I think when you stand, when you do a journey like that, you can only hope for the, hope for the best. And yeah. I think what you guys do is amazing. So thank you. And uh, please keep us updated. Thank you very much.